So, I, um, I'm sorry that I don't stand up to speak, but I, I broke my toe on Sunday, so I'm sort of limping around the place like some, uh, something out of the, 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 the monster of Nostra, Notre Dame. Um, I suppose I'll say just two words about uh, who I am to give you some, some background to it. So I, I trained uh, as an engineer, really as a computer vision and well, machine vision and machine hearing engineer. In, in Cambridge, I was in the machine learning lab, which is in engineering, and then the graphics and interaction lab as a research assistant in computer science. Uh, I then moved to the EPFL, where I, I still am. I submitted my, my thesis uh, last Friday, in fact. So I joined, uh, I joined as a computer scientist. I got a fellowship as a computer scientist, joined a computer vision lab, Sabina Sustrunk's image and visual representation lab. Uh, and in 2018, EPFL decided they would make a new uh, PhD program in the digital humanities. And so I transferred in 2018 into this new PhD program. And since I've been uh, finishing my thesis as a, as a visiting uh, fellow, first at uh, the Harvard uh, Renaissance Studies Center and then at the Max Planck for Art History in Rome, which is where I am now. So I've somehow moved from the computer vision world to the other world. And actually, my thesis is much more humanities heavy, I would say, than I expected it to be. Uh, and what I thought I was going to talk about when we were organizing this thing is open problems. And I thought, well, I, this is, I would actually repeat a, a presentation I gave to my own lab in Lausanne, where I just say, here's us some, some useful problems that we need to solve. Please solve them. But, but then I, I thought, actually, that's maybe not what you want to hear. Um, so if I manage to click next. There we are. Oh. There's a little lag here. So, um, yeah, 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 it's just the internet's a little slow because it's on Google Sheets. All right, so, so what I'll actually talk about is, is basically uh, distant reading in art history and, and why computer vision and data science have a, a key role in uh, art history to, to have a really close collaboration, a much closer collaboration than uh, simply application scenarios, let's say, and which I think we should model actually on something that you, else that your lab does really well, which is biomedical imaging, how close that has become and, and how it's become its own field uh, in its own right. So just a few slides on computer vision in art history, which is not the same thing as computer vision on art, which is a, a big world, which I'm also a little involved in through things like the VizArt workshop at ECCV, um, and which has some really interesting problems in non-photographic, uh, let's say, computer vision and image understanding. But this is not actually what art historians end up seeing. What art historians end up seeing largely is uh, search engines, visual search, which they use often, from commercial things like Pinterest to uh, research projects. This is the, the one from Heidelberg, I'll, I'll flick through these very quickly. Um, lots of search engines for uh, prints and woodblocks because they're repeated so many times in different publications and tracing them is already a, a common art historical and book historical uh, challenge. So uh, Oxford, the VGG Zissimans group in VGG has worked on that and the UC Davis and UC Santa Barbara groups. Um, and more recently from, from my own university, um, also things that, that, let's say, directly concern iconography in paintings and that try and do this in a, a cross-modal way. All of these work in pretty much the same way. So you uh, select the region of an image, you try and find some similar images. Of course, the distance functions uh, are customized to whatever the particular kind of similarity you're looking for. They might be cross-medial, they might not be. Uh, and usually, they also offer some kind of uh, refinement step. You see here plus or minus or x. This basically fine tunes a linear SVM at the end and uh, gives you a second result stage. And the, the Heidelberg tool does very much the same thing. All right, the other thing that they see, that they're starting to see, that they're starting to use, is uh, visual links. Of course, this comes out of the search engine problem. Um, sometimes uh, these things are, are links between, directly between uh, images, let's say. And, and they operate on the image level, and therefore they, they you know, necessarily um, relate to the entire image, even if they're really about details. This came out of the Replica project as well. And sometimes this is something presented at CBPR last year. They relate to specific details within an image. So the kind of annotations you might imagine is you know, one area of this painting relates to one area of this painting. What makes this interesting is that it no longer necessarily obeys the triangle inequality, right? So for instance, uh, here image, the image in the middle is similar to the image on the left and similar to the image on the right, but the two outer images actually don't have any similarity between them. Okay. And the final thing that 
again, art historians do use and, and use all the time, let's say, or relatively frequency, is corpus visualization. This started from very, very simple things that Lev Manovich was doing in the mid-2000s, really just plotting data sets on, uh, based on hue and intensity and things like this. Um, and often these uh, visual search engines give you a way to kind of basically visualize the results of your image search in, in some uh, feature space. This is taking the uh, feature embedding from the uh, Siamese network that, that Replica uses, uh, which is a, a custom train network, and then just doing TSNE on these features to give you a 2D visualization. And uh, the, a tool called Pixplot from the ALDH lab does, does really exactly the same, but on the penultimate layer of the VGG19 network. So again, a pre-trained network which doesn't actually know anything about uh, art or mediality or anything like this, or the fact that a print is close to a painting, perhaps. Um, but it just, it just takes those features and, and plots them on. OK. What I want to do very quickly is say why uh, we need to engage with uh, art historians on a level that is beyond image search. And the first reason for this is that we have some genuinely big data in the history of art, right? So, so perhaps you've uh, heard about the Pharos Consortium. Uh, the Ferris Consortium is a consortium of photo archives, and it includes, uh, it includes the uh, Max Planck Institute for Art History. It includes uh, Photo Marburg in Germany. It includes uh, the Getty Institute in LA, uh, the Frick Collection in New York, and so on and so on. And they are promising uh, open access uh, to 25 million images from the history of art. So these are scanned photographs that are in these uh, photo libraries, which is what art historians before the internet used to use to look up paintings, let's say, and they're all uh, catalogued and they all have captions. They look a little bit like this. This is an example from our collection in Rome. Uh, 25 million images is a really significant amount, I don't have to tell you. It's, it's a, a sizable chunk bigger than ImageNet. It's very much bigger than, than Coco, and it's, it's well on the way to being done. So they got initial funding for this in the middle of this year, and for instance, our contribution to the consortium, which is 1.2 million images, is already going to happen by the end of this year. So how are we going to deal with the information in these enormous image sets? Um, if you just take a search engine and try and get the five closest uh, images or the ten closest images to your query, you're only ever going to have a complexity of information on the order of ten elements, right? If you try and do some visualizations, some two-dimensional visualizations like we've seen in TSNE, you might have on the order of the number of elements that you're looking at. Um, but if we really try and use links between images, and perhaps even links between the things that are inside images, like gestures, like human poses, uh, then we start to have an enormous amount of information, um, which you know, might be on the order of 10 to the many. I, d I don't want to really suggest that it's 10 to the 16, but it's certainly many, many, many links, uh, potential links, if we have a, a dense connection of visual wow. phenomena between each possible pair of images in our section of 25 million from Pharos. All right. So how do we actually deal with this kind of complexity? How do we uh, offer this kind of complexity to art historical research? It's very difficult to see how to do that through building a user interface or something like this or a little tool. Um, how do we offer a, a data science for art history with genuinely big data, in other words? And perhaps how do we offer some kind of... Uh, access to art historians, maybe through publications, maybe through uh, other types of tools that, that allow them access to this complexity of data. So this is where uh, distant reading comes in. Distant reading uh, is a tendency in literary studies that's been going on for the last 10 years or so. Um, it really came out of the Stanford Literary Lab, and it started through very simple things like counting the frequency of words in very large collections of novels in the 19th century. Um, it goes on to, let's say, more complex phenomena like uh, topic modeling. Here, this is actually a World Bank reports. It's an interesting figure. This, this blue trend line shows a specific actions that the World Bank took. Words like, you know, we built, we constructed a dam, etc. This uh, orange line shows management speak, like, you know, we are reassessing our consultancy for impact evaluation in, etc. And uh, this graph actually got the World Bank director to uh, resign uh, in 2016. So it's an extremely powerful, uh, socially powerful, let's say, uh, technique. And, and sometimes there are more sophisticated visualizations. These are, these are word embeddings based on grammatical differences, for instance. And of course, it's also been used in, in musicology. So this is a, 
a recent project from our own university that looks at uh, chord transitions in Beethoven, for instance. All right, what's the place of computer vision in all of this? Uh, is basically that uh, if we're dealing with enormous numbers of images, we have no pre-existing uh, symbols that we can work with. We have no word frequencies, we have no sentence lengths, we have no chords or key signatures, as in music. Um, and computer vision and then you know, data science on the features extracted therefrom uh, can really help us start to deal with these kinds of uh, complex visual phenomena. But it's not so simple because uh, art history actually doesn't deal doesn't readily offer uh, the kinds of theory that, for instance, literary studies and musicology does, because it's not used to dealing with uh, corpus questions. It's not used to dealing with theories that are about big groups of images. This is a little test I did on the two main English language journals uh, of literary studies on the left and of art history on the right, the Modern Language Quarterly and the Journal of the Warburg and Courtauld Institutes. And uh, essentially, about half of the Modern Language Quarterly articles are about what you might call a, a corpus, right? So here's some examples of that. We look at late 18th and early 19th century non-narrative songs or the feminist modernist historical novel, things like this. So it'd be easy to see how we would assemble a group of those things. In general, art historical research papers tend to focus on individual works, individual authors, even details, you know, this last one here on the right, a particular iconographical detail on one image in the Moscow Kremlin Cathedral. And it turns out that about 97% of uh, this sample, which is the last four years of the, the main English language art history journal, focus on individual things, and very, very few focus on, on this corpus level. So how do we translate uh, these concepts that are actually quite far and few between from art history into things that we can use computer vision to look at. How, how in other words, do we negotiate between the real research agenda of art history, the, the open problems in that field, and um, computer vision? Well, I'm going to very, very briefly go through three little projects, little examples of, of, of how this was done. The first is uh, the theory of a uh, famous founder of the discipline, a uh, German called Abi Warburg, from the start of the 20th century, writing mainly between 1900 and 1930, let's say. And his uh, famous theory was of the pathos formel, in other words, the formula for the expression of uh, pathos, of extreme energy, of extreme emotion. Um, and he noticed in a paper on Dürer in 1905 that uh, these... Uh, main figures here, these are all scenes of the death of Orpheus, that these gestures all seem to keep some kind of consistency, even when everything around them, the menids that are trying to kill him, let's say, or the uh, trees in the background, or the scene, or even the, the geometry, the flipping, they all change. This, by the way, is from a, a 4th century BC uh, Greek vase from, from Cusi, so it, it's really going across millennia. So we thought, okay, how can we capture the um, essence of this idea of the pathos formal. Well, an obvious first idea is to do some kind of uh, gesture recognition. It turned out that gesture recognition, the, the, the recall at this stage, this was about 2016, was not so high, so we in fact annotated many, many images manually, about 2,000 skeletons, uh, each annotated three times. And it turns out that, that there are basically many of these pathos formal that, that Warburg and other people talk about. Another famous one is the so-called nymph. Um, and here you see two examples of the, of the nymph. She's often carrying something. She's often running. Um, and in the middle, you see where these two details come from, which is, is a panel with many, many photographs of different artworks placed on. And this is a panel from Warburg's so-called Builder Atlas, the image atlas that he assembled in the late 1920s. Okay? So this gave us a kind of corpus. It was, it was implicitly a theory about a kind of corpus that we could start to unlock. It turns out that you know, very, very st uh, simple statistical uh, distributions. Um, essentially, uh, these, these are non-Euclidean um, uh, principal components on, on the rotational uh, vectors of the angles of the, of the, of the bodies. Um, immediately distinguish, in this case, nymphs from non-nymphs and so on, and, and the same thing for the dying Orpheus from the other figures. So it turned out that, you know, by reading one panel at a time of this builder atlas, we could tell more or less from the distribution of gestures within it that the pathos formal was separate from all of the other bodies. So we thought, okay, let's do this on the entire Builder Atlas, and let's try and assemble a 
kind of schematization of all of the different uh, pathos formal. Okay? And this is something that Warburg himself had indicated that he wanted to do. Uh, there's a famous table in his notebooks from the 1910s called Schematismus der Pathosformel, where he tries to write down all of the different pathosformel at the top, perhaps, you know, running and victory and uh, death and lamentation and so on, and build a, a construction of all of these things. So I won't go through the whole uh, distribution of gestures that, that we found in the Builder Atlas, but let me give you the headline result which is that uh, rather than finding lots of different clusters, one for each of these emotions, which is what everyone in the scientific literature in the last 100 years had suggested, we actually found that all of the pathos formel were in one corner of the distribution. Um, they were all in these, let's say, three clusters at the top of this uh, TIS and E map. They all pretty much fit into this uh, particular gestural morphology, which once you look at the skeletons, seems kind of obvious. I mean, they have, for instance, one raised arm and one lower arm. They have some distortion in their, uh, in their legs. They have some rotation in their spines and so on. Um, so this kind of, of, of gestural unity of these pathos formel, you can kind of see from the skeletons, and certainly you can see from the TSNE map, but it had never been suggested before that actually there aren't all of these different uh, pathos formel, that they all share some common characteristics. They're all species of a common genus, let's say. So again, we take uh, Warburg's theory, we uh, operationalize it, that's what we call turning it into an algorithm, into a series of measurements, um, but then we also learn something about the theory. We, we don't just try and prove it or disprove it, we actually add complications. We realize, for instance, that there is this extra layer of unity that, that was present that nobody had seen before. Um, this is some work with, with Peter, who's sitting in the second row, which you, I realize you, you might have already seen, but... Um, I'll just go through it very briefly. Um, this was trying to, to look at the thought of an art historian called Michael Baxendale, who said that when a Florentine patron in the 1400s looks at an image like this, looks at an image of Annunciation, he doesn't just see a uh, holy image. He sees a particular time point in the narrative of the story, right? And he suggested that you can see that these different images relate to different time points in the story. I won't go through the whole uh, gospel of the Annunciation, but essentially there are different let's say, events within the Annunciation in the conversation between Mary and the angel that, that you know, leads to different emotions in Mary. Um, so again, we, we annotated many of these. We said, well, if we can cluster pathos formel, for instance, then we might be able to cluster uh, the different uh, stages of Mary. And it turned out that actually you, 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 you can't at all. I mean, this is, this is one of many uh, different visualizations that we tried, different, different uh, dimensionality reductions that we tried, but, but it's really difficult to separate the different uh, stages of Mary based only on this geometry of the pose. Of course, you can find new links, links between uh, images that have some direct historical connection. These are two images made by the, the same school in Siena, some hundreds of years apart, or links which are very, very broad, which go north and south of the Alps and so on. But these particular gestural links, let's say, they don't always correspond to the same phase. So then we started looking a little bit at um, Mary and, and Gabriel and the interaction between the two and actually saw that, that Gabriel's gestures are much more varied. They have much greater variance than Mary's. So uh, we started, let's say, looking at gesture maps of these and categorizing these and clustering these. And then we were able to say, okay, well, if in an individual image you almost always have one figure of Mary and one figure of Gabriel, what's the relationship between the two? Um, and we were able to, to annotate a data set of this and really look at the intercausality, let's say, between the gesture of Mary and Gabriel. Not only this, but we can see that this intercausality changes historically. So in the 1400s, uh, there's this very, very strong relationship between uh, a kneeling uh, Gabriel and a, a kneeling Mary who's at the end of this uh, stage in, in the so-called humilitatia. She's accepting her uh, holy task, let's say. Whereas uh, a few years later, in the 1500s, suddenly you see a very, very strong relationship between flying Gabriels and Mary in the so-called contubati, at the start of the story, when she's scared of this angel. And again, you can see this directly into pictorial practice. So we take what, again, is a schema, a particular theory, a particular claim in the history of art, and we transform it into a set of measurements, um, a set of measurements that then potentially can be automated, can be done on a very, very wide scale with computer vision. And then 
of course, feed it back into art history. It turns out that this has some historical explanation, for instance, to do with the development of theater practices in the 1400s when Gabriel was winched down uh, in a little cage. Um, and that has to do with this, this new flying tendency in the images. All right, the last thing I'll go through for just uh, two minutes, and then we'll pause for questions, is the question of illumination, divine light. I said, well, you know, these are all fairly recent art historians, but actually most of what uh, art history is about is not comparing modern theory with old images, but comparing old theory with old images. Uh, I mean, this is, of course, a, a simplification, but, but that's a, a, a large part of the, of the game. And so I took this uh, theory of divine light of a, a guy called Giovanni Paolo Lomazzo, uh, who's the only person, the first person to write a theory of how divine light should work in paintings, and the only person to do so in the 16th century, and uh, looked at how this theory of his theory of divine light relates to the practice at the time, um, particularly through this very, very well curated data set of 31,000 paintings from the Fototeca Zeri that's been you know, published as, as proper data with uh, start and end dates and iconographic categories and things like this. So it turns out, for instance, that there are various different ways of, of showing divine light. These are all uh, images from the same. Um, seen but just at, at slightly different times by different painters, you can see that sometimes we have something that looks almost like daylight, sometimes we have light that maybe comes from the middle, sometimes it seems to come from the angel, sometimes it seems to come from behind the angel, sometimes it comes from the side and there's no angel in sight, sometimes it even comes from the moon, and all of these uh, different techniques, it turns out, have a, a frequency that uh, lasts at most, let's say, 50 years. They're very, very f um, quick fashions that, that enter and exit the, uh, the, the repertoire very quickly. And what we can see about this particular time scale, 1550 when Lomazzo was 12 years old and 1572 is when he became blind and started to write, uh, is that actually there was an enormous richness of different, um, different ways to show divine light at that particular moment. I'll, uh, I wanted to play a little interactive game, but I'll, I, I'll skip it for, for time. But there's, there's some difference between these two uh, images in how they show divine light coming there from the top. So these are both images of the Pentecost. The Holy Spirit is coming down. They're both from the 1500s. But you'll see on the right, the shadows really come from this uh, angel at the top, from this, from this Holy Spirit at the top, this dove. On the left, the shadows have nothing to do with the divine light. Okay? And it turns out that, uh, again, if we look at all the Pentecosts and start measuring, well, how many of them have light from the uh, Holy Spirit and how many have actually light from a different source, which, again, pretty tricky, actually, for computer vision to do this automatically, but for now we can do it manually. We can see that uh, when Lomato was writing, there was absolutely no consensus on this. It was really a moment of transition. Okay? So Lomato suggested that, that there should be shadows, in fact, um, uh, and, and no one had noticed that this was a really controversial thing to state. Okay, you can also look a little bit at, at, at darkening in the 1600s. I'll, I'll skip through that and just talk very, very briefly about this last point, which is uh, the modeling of shadows. So, again, uh, this is a particularly important uh, painting for representation of divine light in the 1500s. And uh, a couple of people had suggested that... Um, the light isn't, isn't really clear in this painting, in this Correggio Notte in, in Dresden. It seems like the uh, light is coming from the baby, but actually if you look at the baby, it has shadows. Um, and this is not at all what you know, would have been done a little earlier when there's just rays of light coming directly out of the baby. So what's going on here? Well, we can actually uh, model the faces in, in 3D automatically and, and start reconstructing different potential lighting solutions for the other faces in the image. Um, just through, you know, simple uh, Fong shader or something. And, and we can tell, we can actually give some, you know, visual evidence at least that the most sensible solution for this uh, light source in the image seems to be not from the baby, but actually from this in-between point. These are the, let's say, uh, zoom-ins, and this, is, this top right one is the, is the ideal solution. And again, if we start doing this automatically, we can uh, do some simple optimization, uh, techniques and, and really get this on, on wide data sets. So this is the, an example of having taken a theory of art history, take it really down to the bare basics, uh, take it really down to you know, a measurable uh, piece of content and then find a way to make it automatic and scale it up. And that way we can get to these 25 million images. I'll stop there um, because I'm running out of time, but thank you very much. <laughs>